I have the honor and privilege of introducing uh, Jeff Speck this evening. If book sales are any, and video views are any indication, Jeff Speck is one of the most listened to city planners in the world. Suburban Nation, which Mr. Speck wrote with Andres Duane and Elizabeth Plater Zerbeck, was one of the best selling planning titles of the 2000s. The Wall Street Journal called it the Urbanist Bible. His award winning book, Walkable Cities, published in 2012, was the dominant planning title of its decade and was named the second best urban planning book of all time. His TED Talks and YouTube videos have been viewed more than six million times. He was voted one of the 10 most influential urbanists of all time. Formerly the Director of Design at the National Endowment for the Arts, Mr. Speck is a partner at Speck Dempsey, an urban planning firm based in Boston. In 2022, he celebrated the 10th anniversary of Walkable City with a new edition containing eight new chapters. Help me welcome Jeff Speck. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. This is great to see such a big crowd. And it really does, you, each one of you is here who is here um, individually is, honors me to, to see your face. So thank you for coming. Um, and, and I feel a responsibility to give you a, a, a good show. Um, and thanks to Jeff and to Lee and to Chandra. And, and I have to say, this whole thing, as far as my interface has been concerned, um, has been through uh, Patrick Puma at the Urban Design Center studio, excuse me. And he, he coached me really well. He sent me about two dozen different reports <laughs> to review, uh, maybe a dozen projects underway. Um, I already have spoken to a, number of, to a number of people at the city and said, I hope I don't step on any toes. But my goal, I think, is to make everyone at the city uh, make their job easier. Because there's a lot of great stuff already happening here. And uh, the arguments behind the stuff, which isn't necessarily uh, as well known as they should be, aren't as well known as they should be, um, are a lot of the arguments I'll be making tonight. So uh, buckle down. I've got a ton to show you. I think I have more than 300 slides, but I do go fast. We're calling this towards a more walkable Louisville, and I like to show this slide as kind of, here's my credential, but I know being here in Kentucky, this is a much more significant credential, so I wanted to, 2016, <laughs> moving right along. So um, in my book, Walkable City, and in most of the stuff I write, I like to tell two stories, essentially why we need to make our cities more walkable and how to make our cities more walkable. And uh, the why we need it talk is a really compelling set of arguments, but you're not getting that tonight because I don't have enough time uh, to spend on the how, and so we're skipping that entirely. However, there's a TED talk, it's only 15 minutes, that uh, I would direct you to. If you go to TED.com, there's a couple talks on there, but this is the one, the one without pictures, the one that's just my face, that is the, the main three arguments why we need to make our cities uh, more walkable. I hope you'll go there, but now we're going to get straight into the, the, the substance of how to make our cities more walkable. So in Walkable City, I introduced what I call somewhat tongue-in-cheek, the general theory of walkability. And the general theory of walkability asks the question, in, particularly in America, where driving is so cheap and so easy, and most of us own cars, and the car is there in the driveway, between you and everything, and it's heavily subsidized, and every mile you drive actually costs less than the mile before that, and actually four-fifths of the cost of driving are uh, fixed costs, and only about one-fifth are variable costs. So the smart thing to do if you have a car is to drive it all the time. So with all those odds against not using the car, how do we create an environment in which people will make the choice to walk, or actually to bike as well, but we're gonna frame it through walking. And the question is, how do you do that? And the answer is the walk has to be as good as the drive. And to do that, it needs to do four things simultaneously. It needs to be useful, it needs to be safe, it needs to be comfortable, and it needs to be interesting. And th th those four things are the framework then of Walkable City, but also of my talk tonight. So we're gonna march through each of those categories and see how it applies, particularly to the downtown of a city like Louisville. Um, so the useful walk, it's a story I learned from my mentors, Andres Duany and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. Andres used to give a talk called The Story of Planning as a Profession, and talked about how back in the 
19th century, people were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills. And the planners, who weren't yet called planners, said, hey, let's, let's move the housing away from the factories. And they did. And lifespans in, in, uh, increased immediately and dramatically. And the planners were hailed as heroes. And we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So you have the onset of Euclidean zoning, the separation of the landscape into large areas of single use, um, where multifamily is separate from single family, and office is separate from medical office, and everything is a drive apart. And you know, I was an art history major, which they say wasn't the most lucrative choice, but I can say that you don't want a Rothko, you want a Syrah, right? Rothko was the blob guy, and Syrah was the pointillist. And the more pointillist your zoning, or in this case, the actual land uses, the more fine-grained and confetti your land uses are mixed all together, of course, the more walkable a place is because it's more useful. And this map of Manhattan is even misleading because this red color is vertically mixed use within each building. So that's the most walkable approach to making a place, which leads kind of to the fundamental new, new urban, and Andres and Liz founded the new urbanist movement many years ago, the fundamental new urban argument, which Andres is completely sick of telling audiences about, but I still do because I think it's so important, and it's why I got into this business, which is to understand that there are only two tested ways to make community. One way is the tra traditional town, neighborhood, and the other is suburban sprawl. This is Newburyport, Massachusetts, not far from where I live. It's defined as a traditional neighbor neighborhood by being compact and uh, diverse and walkable. Uh, typical neighborhoods are about a five minute walk from edge to center, almost, almost always across cultures and around the planet. And throughout history, it's about a half a mile across. Um, it's diverse in the sense that there are places to live and bigger houses and smaller houses and places to work and places to worship and places to shop and places to recreate, all within walking distance. Most of your daily needs are accessible on foot. And because there's lots of streets and they all connect, it's actually walkable because none of the streets need to be all that big. So, the traditional neighborhood developed naturally in response to human needs. Sprawl was an invention. It was a post-World War II invention. It's defined as being not compact, not diverse, and not walkable. You can see that the utter lack of diversity, a whole square mile, can often hold just one use or just one house over and over again. Um, it's not uh, compact, clearly. That's why we call it sprawl. It spreads out over the landscape. And look at this. There's lots of streets, right? but most of them are loops or cul-de-sacs. The few streets that connect, as a result, have to hold all the traffic of the entire metropolis, and they're designed for no other purpose. So notice they have no front doors. There's no addresses on these collector roads. And uh, they're, they're designed only around one thing, moving as many cars as quickly as possible. We call them traffic sewers. They're not walkable. Now, everyone wants a house on the cul-de-sac for the safety of their kids, but actually, I learned on Adam Ruins Everything that you're 350% more likely to be killed as a pedestrian in this environment than you are in that environment because of those big collector and arterial roads. So it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, where you only shop. Schools get bigger and bigger, and their parking lots get bigger and bigger because they, they, they become consolidated the bigger a school is, the larger an area it has to serve, and busing becomes even inefficient. And so, you know, the parking lot is sized around the, the, the seniors and the juniors driving the freshmen and the sophomores with the death rates to prove it. <clears throat> facilities, sports facilities become more and more consolidated and oversized. This child has a mile and a half drive to get, I have to go off the screen, to get to the, um, to the eight soccer fields and eight baseball diamonds and however many tennis courts. It seems preposterous, right? But when you design an environment with the assumption that everyone is going to drive everywhere, then it makes sense to do this. And that's why it's not walkable. And the part we forgot to count, which is that if you separate everything from everything else and then reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then your highway system, which was designed principally for business and for leisure travel, becomes a commuting way and gets bigger. This is not Photoshop, this is Los Angeles. You, you've got one of these, but it's not, it's not quite as bad. So I always tell people, depending on who you ask when, uh, about half of Americans want this American dream. They want the house 
that's around only other houses. But you need to understand that it's a two-part dream. Uh, this dream comes with this nightmare because of the separation and what it, what it re requires, often to absurd extremes. And the idea that you, know, you have to put so many lanes of travel in this intersection so that you never have to wait more than one cycle at a light. Because if you do, you truly want to shoot your face off in this environment because it's so banal and, and, and heartbreaking. So uh, this is not Photoshop either. Walter Kulash took this picture in Florida. Um, but it, it's stressful on families. The longer your commute, the more likely you are to be divorced. Um, and then an epidemiologist gave me this slide. Howie Frumkin, who wrote Urban Sprawl and Public Health, you know, he tells us that there's a reason why we have the, actually now the second generation of Americans who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents because we've engineered out of our society, out of our landscape, the useful walk. And the idea that you drive to park to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill to walk is why we have an unhealthy society. So driving is no fun. Being a pedestrian can be worse. I've been talking entirely until now when I'm about to stop about the creation of new places. And when it comes to the creation of new places, this is the diagram that I'd like to sear into your retinas because essentially you have the choice between these two models, the sprawl model and the neighborhood model. It's all the same stuff. It's places to work, it's places to shop, it's places to live and recreate. But how big are they? How far apart are they? Do you have what's called a dendritic or a branching street system where there's only one way from everything to everything else? Or do you have a porous network, capillary network of, of many small blocks? Because there's actually great irony behind sprawl, which was designed entirely around driving, is that it actually serves cars worse. Because if there's one engine fire on the street, the city shuts down for an afternoon, right? But there's 21 ways to get from here, lower left to the upper right. And so it's just a much better model all around. It can molt, it can grow, it can evolve. Sprawl's pretty much stuck the way it is because of the limited uh, number of lanes and the reliance on driving. So when we make new places, and you may recognize Norton Commons, which my old firm DPZ did and I was marginally involved in, and David Tomes, the developer, is here, um, when we make new places, we insist that they be mi mixed use. We insist that they have small blocks. We insist that there aren't loops and cul-de-sacs, but you have a real street network. You know, I know that it gets a lot of uh, crap, can I say that, for being where the rich people go. And, you know, I've, people said, oh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's too fancy. But the reason why it's too fancy is because whenever you make a new place, that it's walkable, it gets bought up and up and up and up. It is so rare and special to create a place that has both new real estate, new houses that people want to buy, and a walkable street network that every project I've, like this that I've worked on for 30 years has gone through the roof. And that happened to Norton Commons as well. But what you need to remember about Norton Commons is that it's mixed use. There are places to get your nails done rather than driving out of the community. There's a place to, to, uh, to buy groceries, and cat food, right, rather than driving out of the community, and that's what makes the walk useful. Uh, those are the two models. But now, when we're talking about existing places, like this beautiful place, you ask a different question, which is you look at the uses in the downtown, and you ask, you want to have a nice balance of uses, right? So you ask what uses are missing or underrepresented, and in almost every American downtown, for a variety of reasons, from the 1950s and 60s focus on central business districts, to white flight, to redlining, all these other reasons, um, America's city centers, unlike Europe and even much more so than Canada, um, have a paucity of housing in their downtowns. Yes, thank you. Um, and when you bring the housing back, of course, everything gets better. And that's a story that Jane Jacobs told in the best planning book of all time, uh, which is The Death and Life of Great American Cities, where she asked, writing around 1960, she asked, why isn't there a single great restaurant or a single great gym on Wall Street? And there wasn't. And, and 400,000 people were coming there every day to work. She said, the reason you, need a good, the reason you don't have a good gym or restaurant is because you don't have what she called time spread. And time spread means that a great restaurant needs a dinner crowd as well as a lunch crowd, and a good gym needs people at night as well as during the day. And so you need to have people living there. And you can't just invite them downtown with you know, one-way street networks and highways. 
you have to put them there in housing. And so cities are doing that, and they're subsidizing it. And I don't know how much the city here is doing. I know one story uh, of Des Moines where I've, where I've been working, um, where they went from about 2,500 units of housing downtown. I've heard you have about, you have about 3,000 now in a city much bigger, I think, than Des Moines. But you have about 3,000 units downtown. Des Moines went to about 10,000 units, units downtown, and they did it by offering 10-year tax abatement to developers, and then an additional 10 years of tax increment financing. You don't have to know what that means except to say that it worked. <laughs> so the city understood that their tax rolls in the long run would become much stronger if they made the effort to become great by putting more housing in their downtown core. And there are certainly some really positive new developments, either recently built, uh, like Beecher Terrace, or underway, or planned, the Greyhound Station being replaced by this principally affordable housing development, lots of units, and then what's called the massive New Lou Crossing project, a lot more housing downtown, and then the Starks building, which is, you know, as I understand it, needs a little help. But I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to have folks in, in this gorgeous building, um, and it's worth the city's effort to help make it happen. That's the first category of the useful walk. The second thing to discuss under the useful walk is transit, because you can have a perfectly walkable neighborhood without transit, but you can't have a walkable city without transit, because if people can't get from the different walkable places to the other walkable places without driving a car, then everyone's going to buy a car and the city reshapes itself, as it already has to a great extent, around everyone driving everywhere. So transit is super important, um, and you are fortunate that you're going through a network redesign right now, but not just any network redesign, you're actually working with, and I'm not just saying this because he's in the audience, but what I tell everyone, you're working with the best transit planner in the world. His name's Jarrett Walker. His book, Human Transit, is the best book I've ever read on transit. When you're done reading Walkable City, not before, you should read Jarrett's book. Um, but he uh, is here, live in Louisville, and more importantly, the public outreach for this plan is going to be this summer. And it's very, uh, it's very common for people who are active um, and care about urban design and care about city planning to not realize the connection to transit and not participate as much when it comes to transit decisions. But I encourage everyone in this room to look at the schedule, be aware of the meetings, uh, there, there will be plenty of notification, and have your voice be heard. Because transit uh, downtown is going to be really important for its success, especially because there's a, I keep hearing the term fiscal cliff. I don't know what that means, it sounds bad. But there's a, there's a real financial crisis. Um, so you've got like the good news and bad news of a great redesign happening, and then you've got the, the, the lack of funds. And it's important um, to support transit because you really want other people taking it. This is a headline from The Onion. It's a joke. But the, 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 there's a couple points to make here. You know, we may not take transit ourselves, but we benefit tremendously from other people taking transit, not driving, driving on our streets. But the other thing is, you know, people who don't have a lot of money, it's an incredible burden to have to have a car to live your life. According to, according to the federal government, people who are quote unquote poor are paying as much or more for transportation as they are for housing. So it really, even if you give them affordable housing, it's still really hard to meet a budget unless you have good transit. So I would encourage you to do everything you can to support um, funding for transit in your city. That's the first category. <clears throat> now we're gonna get to the big one, the second category, where we're gonna spend most of the night, the, the, and I mean the night, we'll be here till midnight. So the safe walk is, is where I spend most of my time because it is the crisis that most cities and towns are facing, and this is Staten Island, which is the suburban part of New York, but it's even worse in the suburbs. People are surprised to learn they're much safer actually in downtowns than they are outside of cities, um, but your, your city is certainly designed um, uh, to encourage high speed in ways that we'll describe. So only about 14% uh, of collisions occur with pedestrians and cyclists in them, but about half of the deaths on our streets are pedestrians and cyclists within cities. So we pay a lot of attention to that, and when you care about walkability, you're looking at the safety of walking. So what's happened? Well, in the last 12 years, We've had an 82% increase, as of 2021, an 82% increase in the number of pedestrians killed uh, in, our, in our streets. And there's a number of reasons for that. I actually really 
like talking about it and going through them. I don't really have time tonight uh, to explain why, but the key thing we can do to, to bring that number down is to make our streets safer. And the principal way we can do that is to get folks to drive slower. It's a geometric relationship. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. A car going 35 miles an hour is about seven times as likely to kill you as a car going 25 miles an hour. And that range from 25 to 35 is the speeds that we typically witness in our downtown cores, and they're strictly a function of the environment. What I'm gonna be spending the rest of this section talking to you about is what are the aspects of that environment that cause people to drive principally the speed limit or 10 miles over the speed limit. Because in the US, de street design and traffic design unfortunately descended from, grew out of highway design. And the first street engineers who applied that profession to the design of city streets were trained on highways. And when you're designing a highway, it's a very different strategy than designing an urban street. Because on a highway, think about how you set your speed when you get on a highway. If you're like me, you look for the speed limit, and then you set your cruise, <coughs> you set your cruise control for nine miles an hour over the speed limit or whatever margin works for you. If speed is a function of speed limit, then anything you can do to remove potential for conflict, to create elbow room, to introduce forgiveness, makes the highway safer. Wider lanes, no parallel parking, no opposing flow in the other direction, no intersections, no trees, <clears throat> which we call FHOs, fixed and hazardous objects. So all those things make a highway safer. Unfortunately, those are all the things that make a downtown street more dangerous. Because the principal way that you set your speed in an in a inhabited area is not the speed limit, but it's all the cues that you're getting from your environment. So let's go through what those cues are that cause people to drive faster or slower. The first is block size. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200-foot blocks. This is Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, famously 600-foot blocks. This is some of my family crossing the street in Salt Lake where they give you flags to hold up so you aren't run down. A 600-foot block city kind of wants to be a six-lane city, while a 200-foot block city can be a two-lane city because you have all this real estate you need to serve. There's very few streets. They have to be big, or that's the tendency in the U.S. at least. So there's a clear relationship, inverse relationship, between block size and safety. Here's a study of 24 different California cities. When the average block size roughly doubles, the number of non-highway fatal crashes almost quadruples. So this is your downtown, and you're in pretty good shape. Here you are compared to Salt Lake City. Your blocks are, are closer to 300 feet than 600 feet, so we say you've got good bones. There are some longer blocks, there's some smaller ones, but you, you have a perfectly good foundation to be walkable. <clears throat> so we can say that's not the problem. Next is the number of lanes. The more lanes there are, the more it looks like a highway, the faster the, the drivers go, the further you have to cross. This is Oklahoma City. I was called in about a dozen years ago because Prevention Magazine, in their best walking cities issue, called them the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country, which really hurts. They obviously hadn't been to a lot in Oklahoma. But the mayor said, what do we do? And I said, let's do a walkability study. And he said, what's that? And I said, I'm not sure, but we'll figure it out together. And we looked at the car counts in the downtown core and the number of lanes in the downtown core. Now we all know, any engineer will tell you, even the most conservative, that a two-lane street, two-way, without turn lanes can handle 10,000 cars a day. So we then looked at this, the, the numbers in the downtown core, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000, 9,000, and these were all streets that were four to six lanes and were designated to stay four to six lanes with this number of cars on them. <clears throat> so we said, wow, you've got this tremendous mismatch between supply and demand for lanes. Now, not every city has this condition. Most cities have it just in some streets and not others. But the, the opportunity there is a whole bunch of asphalt that's serving no purpose except to cause speeding and danger. And so fortunately, the same week that our study came out, Devon Energy decided to build a new tower, 51-story tower in the city center that was kicking off $200 million in tax increment 
And they said, where should we spend that money? And they decided, let's rebuild, let's rebuild every street in our 40-block our urban core from building face to building face. And they haven't rebuilt every street, but a lot of them. It was my job to design the curb to curb of all the streets in the downtown core. I was able to remove one third of the driving lanes. I was able to double the number of parking lanes and to introduce a, a bike network where they did not have a bike network. So this street, four lane one way, became this street with a train in it. That was later. Uh, this street became that street, et cetera. But this is what you do when you, when you have money. I always tell cities, uh, this is great, but don't rebuild, restripe. Because you can restripe a whole neighborhood for the price of rebuilding just a couple streets. There are cases where it makes sense to invest in a new beautiful infrastructure, but you can get a lot more done with striping, which has been my experience in most places. Now, I, I've noticed recently in the, in the main remade plan that you guys are working on um, that you have a proposal, a good one, for turning this before, which is basically a four-lane one-way, into this after, but it's a four-lane two-way. You see that? It's a four-lane two-way. And it narrows down after the intersections. But the question is, do the car counts require those four lanes? Because if they don't, it'd be nice to have a partner to this one bike lane that doesn't have a bike lane in the other direction, right? So, now notice that was framed as an if. So I'm not telling you it's a mistake, I'm just telling you that that's the sort of analysis that we do when we're wondering how to redesign a street. You also, as someone informed me today, and I noticed in the Google, you also have a lot of four-lane streets. You had an engineer here who really enjoyed four-lane streets, as you find in many cities. And there's this wonderful thing we discovered about uh, 15 years ago called the classic American road diet. And it, it happens because four-lane streets are incredibly inefficient. So we know they're dangerous, right? But b because the turn lane is also the fast lane. But they're also super inefficient because the fast lane is also the turn lane. And this miraculous thing happens when you make it three lanes. Not only do you get a lane for something else, like bike lanes or parking that comes out of the street, but and, and not only do you make the streets safer, tons safer, but you also do not reduce the capacity of the street. I have a chart I'm going to show you in a minute <laughs> that shows it's a study of about 23 different four to three lane reversions and the average capacity afterwards measured in trips per day is just as high or a little bit higher than the capacity before because you're eliminating a, a great degree of inefficiency. So you have blocks like this and, and many examples. Here's the chart. These are averaging about 19, 20,000 trips per day, which is a number I want you to remember before and after, okay? So in your Louisville campus master plan, for example, there's a proposal for Third Street and they're thinking about making it better for bikes. So you take this existing condition and they're doing the proper thing, which is actually bikes out of the street in a separated path, which is fantastic. But notice, by the way, I love the feedback. This is awesome. But, but notice that no one has thought, because I haven't spoken here yet, no one has thought that maybe these four lanes could be three. And honestly, when you have a four laner, there's no reason not to make it a three laner. Okay? Next is one-way streets. Can I tell you, I've wanted to speak in Louisville for a long time. Because you have like the most ruthless one-way system the entire nation. This is Davenport, Iowa, where my wife is from, where we've managed to revert a number of the one-way streets back to two-way. But why are one-way streets so dangerous? Clearly, you only have to look one way before you cross. That would seem to be better, but the statistics say the exact opposite. There's all this momentum of travel going the same direction. Again, it feels like a highway, so uh, people behave like they're on a highway. There's all this momentum just heading right at you, but I believe that the principal thing is the opportunity to jockey. And the way that you are as a driver, the way I am as a driver, when there's that other lane, right? Whenever there's that other lane in the same direction, whatever lane you are in is slower. And you stop looking at the scenery, you stop sitting happily or unhappily behind the car in front of you, and you start finding a way to drive faster. And that's why multi-lane one-ways, not one-lane one-ways, some people mishear me and or I forget to say it, and they try to get rid of their one-lane one-ways. But no, it's multi-lane one-ways, actually one-ways that used to be two-ways um, that are the challenge. And so you, you applied that concept ruthlessly, with I guess the exception of Broadway, 
uh, to your downtown and well south of your downtown stretching to the university. The study that I show around the world, the whole world, uh, was done here in Louisville, Kentucky by Riggs and Gilderbloom, who you probably know. Um, um, John Gilderbloom's at the University of Louisville. And it was on Brook Street, 1st Street, 2nd Street, and 3rd Street. And Brook and 1st were reverted to two-way travel, as you know, and 2nd and 3rd were kept as one-way travel. On the two ways, car crashes dropped by almost a half, and even crime went down. On the one ways, car crashes went up, and crime went up. That was in conjunction with traffic volumes going up on the two-way streets, 13% on one of them and 40% on the other one. Increased traffic, reduced crashes, and reduced crime. So that's a model I show all over the world. I showed it in Cedar Rapids where they also, and I forgot to mention in Oklahoma City, half those streets were one way and we got rid of, we made them all two way. Here in Cedar Rapids, I was given the same request, a ton of four lane one ways. This was the traffic patterns before our study and this is the traffic patterns after. They also had a mismatch between supply and demand of lanes. Um, so we were able to reduce the number of driving lanes the parking where red is angle went from this to this. So the merchants were very happy to have more angle parking. The bike system went from this to this because all those extra lanes that became available. And it was a restripe, a completely restripe plan. So here's a typical street before and after. And this person's learning how to park not in a bike lane. But you know, it was the first day. One you might know better is New Albany, Indiana where I was called in about a decade ago, it might have been a decade ago, maybe a little less, and their entire downtown, for the younger people here, you kids might not know, <laughs> the entirety of downtown New Albany pretty much was one-way streets, and it didn't feel safe, and we proposed an entire reversion, and notice you can take it all the way to the highway, and then you one-way it as you approach the highway, but you can fix it as soon as you land. They were very concerned about it. The fire chief was concerned, the police chief was concerned. They sat on it for three years, and then you know, the residents demanded it. And then in one summer, they did the whole thing. And I had the pleasure of going back in 2019 and touring it with the mayor, and he was very supportive, but most important to me was the traffic is slowed, pedestrians feel more confident and comfortable walking, business is up, and more families are moving to New Albany. Spoken like a true mayor. Um, but more important to me was the police chief who had fought it, who then said, as a police officer in 28 years, he's never seen a better scenario for public safety. Speeds have been reduced, crashes are down, and response times to calls for service are far better than they've ever been. And it's response times that often are an impediment to making these changes because emergency services love having that extra lane. But what they learned was that having to not loop made up for it that they can go directly to the different addresses. Now, you have a lot of one-way streets. I mean, every street, just about, right? Most of them, you've, you've done great work starting to revert some of them, but principally Maine and Market and Jefferson and um, Chestnut and this one. <laughs> and first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, you know, the third has been, has been switched back part way. You don't need me to show you what these look like, what they look like. The other streets where, you know, a narrow street becomes three lanes one way and doesn't feel all that safe. The, the, the main point I want to make and I'm going to return to is that it's great to revert your one-way streets, but does this feel like a safe street right now? You also need to look at the traffic flows and see whether you can limit the number of lanes. The reversions that I've seen, well, this reversion in particular, but also on 3rd Street, it still feels, um, they're, they're biased. And they're still focused on moving a lot of cars in one direction, you know, but we'll let you go the other way. But a true reversion is more balanced and hopefully a bit narrower. And we'll talk about that at the end. Next is the width of the lanes themselves. Andre Stuani used to show this slide and he'd say, the typical road to the typical subdivision in the US is wide enough to allow you to witness the curvature of the earth. And it's true because the standards have been creeping ever wider over the years. So this is a subdivision from the 60s and here's one from the 80s. 60s, 80s, same height of airplane, same size house, but the standards just get wider and wider. And what happens when the lanes get wider? People drive faster on wider lanes. 
thank goodness now there's something called NACTO. And NACTO for cities is kind of replacing AASHTO, which is the Highway Engineer's Manual. And this is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And they make it very clear that the old standard of 10 feet is the proper standard. Now, if you've got a bus lane, you can go up to 11. That's OK. Uh, and many transit agencies really like that extra foot. But 10 feet should be the standard. It's really enough room. But it's a little tight. So you're not going to speed as fast as you would go on a wider street. Now, that's strictly for commercial and heavily trafficked streets. I don't want to neglect to mention that for neighborhood streets, you can go much skinnier. And you know in your, in your great neighborhoods, you have a lot of these, what we call skinny streets, yield streets, or queuing streets, where you have about a 12-foot clear, and that handles two-way traffic. Because it's low volume. It's single-family houses. You can duck into the parked cars when you're passing another vehicle. And that's a great way to design residential neighborhoods. Still illegal in a lot of places. I hope that it's legal here, because it exists here in great numbers. When we build new communities like ION, outside of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, we use this as a two-way yield street. The developer here, his name is Vince Graham. He's an excellent lecturer, and he loves showing his narrow streets and his narrow right-of-ways, and he, he, he quotes this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. And it's fairly accurate. Um, but talking about our urban areas, you know, you've got some lanes that are too wide. So this is Jefferson Street. It's got 12-foot lanes. So if you've got four 12-foot lanes and you can narrow them to 10 feet, all of a sudden you've got eight feet to use for bike lanes or another parking lane or something else right? that's more productive and safer. But I know that you guys will use a 10-foot standard here. What I see in a lot of cities is they say, I, I didn't hear anything here, but a lot of cities say, oh, no, we won't do 10 feet. But then when they can get an extra lane by cramming, in, cramming them down to 10 feet, then they do 10 feet. <laughs> so you have Second Street which manages to fit five lanes because they're actually a little bit less than 10 feet across. So I know that 10 feet is accepted here, and I'm hopeful that is your standard. So I only found one thing to call you out on, which is the Broadway All the Way plan has a lovely, fantastic kit of parts with only one error, which is the dedicated bus lanes are 12 feet minimum. So you need to make sure that they're held down to 11 feet and not any wider, because every foot really has dramatic impact on how fast people drive. And you can see the 11-foot bus lane here in NACTA. Next is parallel parking, an essential barrier of steel that protects the curb from moving vehicles. I wasn't sure how essential it was until I did a walkability study in Fort Lauderdale. You'll notice at happy hour on Himmershie Boulevard, you're allowed to park on this side of the street, but you're not allowed to park on this side of the street. After my study, you were, because I showed them how this is happy hour on the park side of the street, and this was happy hour on the unparked side of the street because no one wants to be you know, three feet away from cars going 40 miles an hour. And then, of course, street trees are a huge part of this picture. Street trees, people thought, you know, as FHOs, fixed hazardous objects, made streets more dangerous. The, the studies now show that streets with trees have fewer accidents because the trees slow, slow cars down, sometimes dramatically. But better, better to hit a tree than to hit a pedestrian. And of course, when you can line up a bunch of trees, it's in, in perspective, it's almost like a wall. If you're missing the parking, it's almost like a wall between you and the street. And I, I found a nice example of that, you know, a sidewalk that's a little too skinny downtown, but the trees make it feel safe. And then around the corner, well, not so much. This is the feeling that this Dutch artist was trying to communicate. <laughs> when you don't have the parked cars, when you don't have the trees, that's how it feels when you're on a sidewalk. Signals. This is not uh, a roundabout signal or something. This is artwork. But it reminds us that we are vastly over-signalized in America. And what's remarkable is how long it took us to figure it out and how most cities don't know it and how I regularly go to cities where they just, they just haven't thought it through. But if you take 60 seconds and think it through, you'll understand why an all-way stop, all stop sign intersection is much safer than a signalized intersection. Right, the, the study that was done more recently, 97, based on a 1972 removal of 472 signals in Philadelphia. They studied 199 of them, and crashes dropped by 24%. Severe injury crashes by 63%, and severe pedestrian injury crashes by 68%. Traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from the elimination of the local habit 
of speeding up to beat the red. With an always stop sign, and people always complain, oh, people are cruising through the stop signs, they don't really stop. So what, right? An always stop sign, only the most flagrant scoff, <laughs> only the most flagrant scoff law is going more than five miles an hour through that stop sign, through that intersection. So there's eye contact, people see each other, the pedestrians are waved through, the bicyclists just blow through, whatever. It's a lot safer than the alternative. And this is my little illustration here. This is, I think, in Eugene, Oregon, but a nice little downtown intersection, one lane in each direction, the always stop. The cyclist is perfectly comfortable going entirely the wrong way. The wheelchair user is, is at, at peace. And I should say that, um, uh, you know, I don't talk much about wheelchair users, um, but I know a number of them who call what they do walking. Walkable City is kind of an ableist name for everything that I do, and I'm a little nervous about that, but a number of wheelchair users I know call it walking. But the most important thing to communicate, particularly to larger audiences, I think you know this, anything you do to make a city better for wheelchair use is going to make it better for walking, right? So, so our, our goals are entirely uh, united in that regard. And when I do a plan for a downtown, like this one in Albuquerque, um, I try to turn intersections into always stops. So the colors indicate where the flow is heavier or lighter, and whenever a moderate or light street is intersecting a moderate or light street, in this case, 17 locations, we proposed turning the signals into stop signs. And they did it in 11 locations, and they bagged the signals, and then people really complained. So they bagged the stop signs, and then people complained even louder. And the item that was in the local news, this is a video that I found online, is that they brought the stop signs back, not only to reduce speeding, but to help with the traffic flow. Because the great secret of replacing, all way, replacing signals with all-way stops is that you can get, down, you get through the downtown faster. I spent a lot of time today driving around with Patrick. I can't tell you how many times we were sitting at signals when no one was going by. That's completely wasted asphalt. So as um, Chuck Marone talks about in this really important book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, there's a whole subchapter on how if he were king, he would remove all signals, put in all stop signs. Obviously, the street has to be a certain size, and there's a key exception. I, I'm, I, I haven't seen Jarrett having a fit over here, but there's a key exception, which is on key transit corridors, it makes sense in many cases to have signals so the buses can get through quicker. But on the other, on the other streets, it probably doesn't make sense. And so this is our plan for downtown Scranton, and actually what you see here, which is going to become quite relevant, is a combination of one-way streets becoming two-way, and then that allows very often the introduction of stop, stop signs instead of signals. And think about a multi-lane one-way intersecting a multi-lane one-way. It's a little bit tough to have a stop sign there because who goes first, right? Who goes next? In fact, I've seen many of them, but most engineers aren't comfortable with that. But when both streets are two-way and there's only one lane in each direction, that's a natural location for putting in an all-way stop. And so when you revert these systems more comprehensively from one way to two way, then you can put the stop signs in place of the signals. We found one, uh, Breckenridge and 7th, where you have the signals still hanging there, but it's been replaced by a stop sign. I understand it's working well. Next is vocabulary. So we're getting into the, like, the nitty gritty here and the more subtle stuff. This is what I call truth in journalism. This is the Las Vegas Sun describing the failed edition half-failed addition to the Vegas Strip a number of years ago, and they said, some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. Do you think? So whenever you have swoopy moves and stream form geometrics and, you know, lots of stripes and highway paint, it just feels like a higher speed environment. Pedestrians are less comfortable, but also people drive more quickly. And what we're starting to do is to remove those geometries from our cities. So this is Midtown Atlanta, where they have a fair number of slip lanes, which they'll, people will say, oh, pedestrian refuge, it's easier to cross the intersection. No, it isn't, because people speed around the corner and don't have to stop at the light. They're filling in the um, slip lanes. And you guys are doing quite well in this regard. It was kind of hard for me to find any um, in your downtown, but I found a couple. You may know this one a little bit to the southwest, which there's no reason why this intersection needs a highway on-ramp. There's no reason why it has to look like that, and those are easy to fix. Now, I wanted to bring up the Broadway all the way plan, and one, one particular thing, and this is, this is quite, you know, this is like, this isn't 101 stuff, this is like 357 stuff. 
when you have a median, if it has no trees in it, it feels like a highway. If it has trees in it, it feels like a boulevard. So this is a great plan, but I, I would put trees in the median, and there's no reason not to. Strategy for putting crosswalks in a city is everywhere there's a desire line, there should be a crosswalk. Because people will cross where there's a desire line. And if you have a crosswalk, they're more likely to be seen. So here you have this weird condition of zigzagging streets, and I know it seems crazy, but there needs to be a crosswalk here, and there needs to be a crosswalk here, and there, you know, there, there, there's, there, this plan is missing crosswalks, and that may just be the nature of this drawing, but I'd ask these folks to revisit the crosswalks in the scheme and make sure that there's one at every desire line. When you remove the center line, I like this because it points, it points to the actual theory behind everything that we're suggesting about safety. When you remove the center line from a street, people drive seven miles an hour slower. <laughs> Why? Because that yellow double stripe tells you that if you stay to the right of it, no one's going to hit you. So it's a perfect example of the fact that you don't want drivers to feel all that comfortable or they drive, that, drive too fast. And one thing we're doing in a lot of cities where we're working, often the public works departments are already doing it, is removing center lines from streets that are just two lane. Maybe not at the intersections, but then once you get back from the intersections, the center lines can go away. And then finally, the bicycle segment. Um, you know, the biggest revolution currently underway in many American cities is the provision of protected bike lanes. Uh, these ones in Pittsburgh, this one in New York City. When they took a lane out of Prospect Park West in Brooklyn and put this cycle track in, the number of cyclists tripled. Sidewalk cycling, of course, went away. Speeding dropped precipitously. And then the big surprise, oh no, not a surprise, Injury crashes went down dramatically. The big surprise was that trip times on this street and parallel streets did not go up because people were basically speeding from red light to red light. So it isn't necessary that a reduction in lanes results in a reduction of, of throughput because it didn't happen here. Uh, this being New York City, there was a drawn out five year lawsuit, but eventually the bike hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. I like to show this picture to contrast it with this picture because you know, nobody wants their daughter in, in the door zone. But we've been evolving so quickly, we're finally introducing to our cities bike infrastructure of the quality that I witnessed in Berlin in the 1990s. You need to protect the bike lane for safety from the door zone, but also because if you don't protect it, people just put stuff in it. Trash barrels in the bike lane, dumpsters in the bike lane, the Uber picking me up every time there could be six empty parking spaces sits in the bike lane. And this is the new standard. When I said Berlin in the 1990s, in Somerville, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Boston, Seattle, oh, so it's here for Somerville, wow, okay. Sharrows are not bicycle infrastructure, particularly on roads like this, but this study came out about six years ago. Several studies found that you were no safer with sharrows than you were without them. And I asked folks, can we get a new sharro symbol that represents the true uh, effect of sharrows? And this was the runner up. Um, but the winner was from Queen Anne Greenways in Canada, it was the Prero. <laughs> Please don't hit me in the bike lane. But you've got some sharrows in some pretty unsafe streets, you know, places where you do not want to be cycling. I noticed in this East Market Streetscape pro project, again, well, first of all, you have the gold standard bike lane here up on one curb. It's exactly what I showed you um, in Somerville. But because it's three lanes, the other way is a share, right? So there's, this is the, uh, another case where the number of lanes is constricting the ability to provide a more complete bicycle infrastructure. And then you've got all these neat little things that have happened. So you've got Ellison Avenue with its bike lane. And by the way, I'd love to, remo I'd love to remove the center line here. I think it'd be awesome to have no, no center line. Castlewood Avenue with its neat bike lane. And then Lexington, which I drove on, pretty amazing stuff you've got going. I tried to bike hypothetically from the, from the campus to town. And if you look at the campus master plan, they really have a downtown campus as well as the main campus. And I think we need to really focus on that one great route from campus to town. And uh, so I got onto Brooks and like, well, this looks pretty good. And then, hmm, okay, back end parking, that's all right, I suppose. And then, oh, now it's a Shiro and now it's gone. So Brooks really currently is not the corridor. 
and I haven't looked enough at the others, there's a plan now, um, you, you can see this connection between the main campus and the downtown campus, or downtown in general. This is not that far. I imagine a lot of students already make this trip, and a lot, lot, lot more would make the trip if it were safer. So um, this plan I showed you does provide that for Third Street. I'm not sure for what length, and here I just show my ignorance, but um, whether it's being done or not, I just want to say having that one low stress connection between the campus and downtown is what you need. There's a lot of mythology around bike lanes that we need to kind of dispel. I know that some folks in the city uh, aren't, aren't happy about them, and, and we, we hear all kinds of different things. What about the folks from the city taking the bike path to steal my television? I've heard that in two different cities. I'm not joking. People said that. So you need to share the information. You know, in Boulder, Colorado, properties adjacent to paths sell for fully 32% more than similar properties 1,000 yards away. But aren't bike facilities tools of gentrification for the elite? Well, most people think this is your typical cyclist. We call him the, ma the mammal, the, the um, um, what is it again? Middle-aged man in Lycra. The middle-aged man in Lycra, the mammal. But this is much more likely your cyclist, because statistically, it's the hotel worker, it's the food service worker, fully 38.5% of the people who bike to work are from the lowest 25% of income earners. So if you want to improve equity, then you will invest in bike lanes. But cyclists get in the way of my commute. So Waze did a poll of all the drivers around the world, thousands, hundreds of thousands of drivers. Guess where the happiest drivers are, and the happiest truckers in the Netherlands, where there's bike lanes everywhere. And the lesson is, is that if you get bicycles, if you give bicycles their own separated infrastructure, then it's just so much better for everybody. And the story here is that, you know, the Netherlands was once not the Netherlands. I was there. I was a kid. I went there in the 70s. Yeah, people biked more than here, but there were cars everywhere. It looked a lot like America in the 70s. Um, but then they had a bunch of deaths pedestrians and cyclists, and the mothers started this Stop Der Kindermord, Stop the Child Death movement, and they launched what eventually became Vision Zero. The idea of designing streets, bike lanes separately, designing streets for low speed, creating an environment that caused the number of annual deaths of children to go from like 300 to like three. It took them about a decade, but they did it. Uh, we have not done anything like it, but you know, a typical street like this became a street like that, so it is possible. I think what I want to leave you with in the bike category is just to say that, that it can be really frustrating because you won't significantly enlarge the bicycle population until you have a fairly comprehensive low stress network. Because it's only when you have a network that's fairly comprehensive that then people will make the choice to bike instead of drive. And so it's hard because you, know, you invest and you're discouraged and you invest and you're discouraged but eventually you hit that critical mass and then you become a biking city. And there's no reason why it can't happen here, especially because you're, you're nice and flat as a city. Now, the comfortable walk is in some ways the most counterintuitive thing that I talk about because all, uh, you know, we, we like to climb mountains and see wide open spaces, but the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. You want to see your predators before they attack you, and you need to feel that your flanks are covered. And if you don't feel that your flanks are covered from attack, you actually don't feel comfortable in a space. So the idea of spatial definition, of outdoor living rooms, of street walls that have a height that approximates the width, and we've been talking about this for 30 years, you know, the one-to-one -one ratio is the Renaissance ideal, three-to-one, great. One to six, beyond one to six, you don't really feel enclosed anymore. And, and the space becomes less comfortable. So, you know, six to one, Salzburg, north of Boston. No one's doing shadow studies in Salzburg. It's perfectly comfortable and delightful. The opposite of Salzburg is Houston. This picture's from the 80s. This part of Houston, you probably know, is doing a lot better. But I, I keep showing this slide to remind us that it's principally the surface parking lot, right? The surface parking lot against the edge of the street that removes the street wall, destroys the spatial definition, and, and makes the space less comfortable. So you, you have tons of them, but most cities do. And the point is that you identify the, the ones that sit on your key pedestrian corridors, and then those are higher priority for investment when it comes, or and permitting when it comes to 
putting more buildings uh, in your downtown. But the best places in almost any city are the tight spaces that are held between uh, the taller buildings, or even Belgravia Court. This is a more residential example, but that spatial definition is key, and we need to remember that. Finally, uh, the final category, the interesting walk. I mentioned one-to-one -one as the Renaissance ideal street. This is a one-to-one -one relationship in Grand Rapids, very walkable downtown, but no one wants to walk on this street that connects the two best hotels to each other, because when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck, and the other side is a conference facility, apparently designed in admiration for the parking deck, it's just, it's boring, and these long horizontal lines and mirror glass and just kind of blankness don't attract pedestrians. We learned from Mayor Riley in Charleston, it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking, this thin crust of building on the edge, or the Chia Pet Garage, as I call it, in South Beach in Miami, preserving the mid-century storefronts. You have the whole spectrum of solutions when it comes to uh, garages, garages against streets. You know, you have exposed, you have a lot of these exposed concrete decks. You have the beginnings of some retail on the ground floor. Uh, if the ceiling is high enough, this can work. And then you have this pretty good, pretty good, as Larry David would say, pretty good example. Um, that someone really went to the effort to create where the pedestrians are, a retail story, and then a uh, residential looking first story of parking. I think you get you get at least two stars for this. And then this amazing example is the sort of thing we do in the cities where we work is we wrap the parking so that at street level you don't even know it's there. This is like the apotheosis. You've achieved it. The question I ask cities are, you know, is that a rule? And my understanding is that you have an urban design, um, uh, you know, department at the city that, that, that likes to see this doesn't like to see the exposed parking deck, and we need to make sure that at least in the places where we hope to have people walking, that the parking decks aren't right up against the sidewalk edge. And then there's blank walls. You've got your fair share of those as well. There's a clear solution for blank walls, which is art, and art which people can understand. I don't know if any of you have been to Philadelphia. It has the best mural program I've probably seen in an American city, but uh, you know, I worked at the NEA for four years, and I like to think of investment in public artworks as performing a remedial function, which is you need to remedy a street space which is dull and unwelcoming, and you can do it with good art, you know, paying artists, not, not, I love school kids, do not let school kids do your murals in your downtown. You want high quality art. This is an American example. Here's a European example. But you know, take care of it, keep it clean. You know, there's simpler versions just with paint. Great murals uh, are, can really contribute a, as a remedial step in a downtown that, that is otherwise uh, lively and beautiful. And it's no surprise that this vertically articulated variety of streetscape is the postcard view that is often shared of Louisville uh, because you don't see the same thing over and over again. And, and that's a final point I wanna make. I think this project is fine and I think you need the housing, but notice it's being called a massive project. I think people think of it as massive because it's all one vocabulary. And I want to introduce to you something you may know about that we use in our projects that's called the demise line. This is a big transit-oriented development we're doing in Newton, Massachusetts. But we've got some pretty big buildings and we break them down and we require the architects to make them look like either row houses or multiple buildings. This is one building, but we're gonna make it look like three. And we have great examples already built three buildings made to look like five, it's simple enough to ask the architects, draw a line and just hand it to different people in your firm. And that creates a sort of variety that makes it interesting uh, to walk down the street. It doesn't have to be traditional. You can be modernist like this one in San Francisco, but breaking down big buildings is another way that we can add interest to walking. Three of these things, the reason to walk, the comfortable walk, and the interesting walk are principally a function of what's lining the street principally private property. It's things that a city can influence over time with investment and with codes, but it's a longer term discussion. The safe walk is what I've ended up spending most of my time on as a planner because most cities wanna see change quickly. Most elected officials wanna see change before the election. And also, um, most cities own most of their streets. And here you have a challenge because the state does control a lot of your downtown streets, and we're gonna talk about what that means, but 
changing your streets is a way, particularly, think about it, you've, you have a lot of parts of your downtown where walking is useful, walking is comfortable, walking is interesting, but it's not safe. And so that's the category where, where I would have you focus. The easiest, quickest way, in my experience, of making downtown Louisville amazing is to look at what happened in Oklahoma City. And I have to say, I was shocked to look at your car counts downtown. I'll zoom in a little bit. 4,000, 11,000 on Main, 4,000, okay, the highway's 29,000, fine. 5,000, 4,000, 8,000, 5,000, 2,500. I had to go back and make sure I was reading it right because they sure don't look like that kind of street. And these are all streets then, with a few exceptions, that could be considerably skinnier. And so you've got Main Street, okay, it's, it's 12,000 cars per day, so it probably wants to have left-hand turn lanes at intersections. But look at this chart. Remember, it's close to 19, 20,000 for the continuous center turn lane. So this is probably a two-lane street with short turn lanes at intersections where people are turning left. And that's all you need instead of four lanes. Market Street, under 10,000 cars per day. I believe it could be a two-lane street. Chestnut Street could be a two-lane street instead of three. Fifth Street, less than, than 4,000 cars a day. So you have all these streets that really, just like Oklahoma City 12 years ago, that are sized as highways but are not carrying that much traffic. And this is a conversation that, that I had to have there with the public, and it's not an easy conversation, but you tell people we will, we will not, well, what you have to do is a pretty complete traffic study. And the traffic study demonstrates what our intention is, which is that systematically we will not reduce the capacity below what the demand is. But we'll make the city a place not just for driving through, but worth arriving at. And that's a conversation that most communities are open to having. How do you make downtown Louisville amazing? Complete two-way reversion, complete. So, and not, not this kind of halfway one lane reversion, but a complete, you know, with the spirit of a two-way reversion. Remove extra lanes, I already described that. Add, now I, I want to turn this around, add bike and parking lanes. When I say add parking, I don't mean add more parking to your downtown. I mean add lanes, the lanes you've taken away from driving, put them into parking lanes and put them into biking lanes. And what goes where is a function of a bike plan, right? But that's what we did in Oklahoma City as well. And always stops almost everywhere. Now, the problem is that the state controls so many of those streets. So it, it's, it's not so simple. You know, it's not like New Albany where they can just decide to do it and then do it. And by the way, I forgot to mention, my New Albany plan was full of bike lanes, most of which were cut out. But it's still a tremendous improvement over what was there. The, the challenge you face is you need, I believe, you need to convince the state to allow you to make these changes on many of the streets in your downtown. I believe the first step to doing that is to having a plan that asks for it completely. A comprehensive reversion plan. And what you've been doing, which is how most cities function and function well, is street by street by street. And actually, there's a fear of the cost. And there's a reason to be afraid of the cost if you're putting in new signal heads every time you add two-way traffic, which you have to do if you don't do it comprehensively and with all-way stop signs. It's a major change. My experience allows me to imagine what your downtown would be like if you were to make that change. And I can say it would be just spectacular. So that's what I'm recommending. Not the only purpose of my being here was to recommend that, but I do believe that's, that's the best thing I can say to you. Uh, as I mentioned, we, did, we, we applied that strategy in Scranton, and they are fighting the state in a friendly fight. They're fighting the state to accomplish it because they're in the same situation uh, that you're in. So thank you. Don't clap yet. Before I um, finish, I always like to, to share some resources with the audience um, I do hope that you will read Walkable City, but people share it with others in order to get them uh, excited about this work. If you are doing this work, either as a public servant or as a professional you know, engineer, planner, or whatever, or as an activist, actually this is the book for you. It's much more technical. It's 101 individual items with graphs and charts and pictures um, that will help you do the work more effectively. There's a 15 minute version of the how that's on TED, that's called Four Ways to Make a City More Walkable. All these resources are available at my website, which is Spec Dempsey is the name of my company, specdempsey.com. And um, thank you for being such a great audience. 
I really uh, had fun tonight. I hope you did too. I'm told there's time for a little Q&A. So hi, my name is El Medina, um, and I uh, spent two years in Finland, which is like one of the coldest countries in the world, but also one of the most like infrastructure, like walkable friendly countries. I see everything, but uh, the only thing that I, that I see that's missing is, for example, when people are walking in all kinds of weather, there needs to be some kind of roof or some kind of like stop where people can just like hide underneath. Because I know in like Europe and other countries in the world, they walk outside all day, so they have to prepare for the kinds of weather that's, that could be coming or changing. Uh, some kind of like overhead, something to protect them during like the snow or the rain or the hail. And then another thing with like the bike lanes, to have somewhere for people to like lock their bikes. Mm. I would say most cities are doing a better job on bike racks than they are on bike lanes, so I didn't mention that, but that's clearly a key component of a proper bike infrastructure system. Yeah. Uh, I also, in, in the proper climates, I also am a big fan of continuous awnings and arcades. So that's a good thing to mention. Thank you. Thank you. I have thought a lot about what it is, why a lot of Louisvillians don't come downtown. And that's what I'd like to talk about, being downtown, uh, which you probably didn't have time to talk about. And I'm sure you and, and other people have thought much about. But I've, I've thought of a lot about this, and I want to say some of the things. There, and it would involve several institutions, of course. TARC having a park and ride to come downtown, affordable. Uh, police with, with people on the beat, so hopefully we would feel more safe. Uh, the city having little trolleys that take us from one place to another. And some of the other things, there are no food trucks, there's no musicians. There are not the kinds of restaurant, affordable restaurants, the kinds of things that bring people downtown, where people can be downtown at 9 o'clock at night and not be afraid. In Nashville, they're downtown and walking around at 9 o'clock at night. You know, shopping, stores open. Um, there's the Henry Clay Theater. There could be a bunch of small theaters use it. Um, there could be restaurants around there. The library, there could be restaurants around here. There is much that can happen in this community that does not happen. Thank you, great information. And um, I actually don't know, you know, cities, cities exist on a spectrum between actively discouraging or outlawing things like sidewalk cafes and buskers and food trucks, and then actually on the other end of the spectrum, creating programs to encourage them. For example, I think both Seattle and San Francisco had a parklet program where if you wanted to take up a parking space in front of your building and put outdoor dining there, they would actually help you do it, right? So there, there are steps, and I'm not aware what the situation here is in Louisville, but, but uh, I would hope the city would embrace, at least embrace and not create red tape around that, that objective. Yes, hi. Hi. I'm not originally from Kentucky, but one thing I've noticed living here is that it seems that a lot of the people outside of Louisville, they hate Louisville. Frankfort hates Louisville. And even I'm, I was raised in Michigan and they hate Detroit. I lived in DC and they hate DC. So from a policy standpoint, how do we go to our leaders and try to convince people to invest in cities that we know they hate? I mean, even mentioning 15 minute cities, these people go crazy. So how do we change their minds? Well, the only thing, the, the only thing I can, not knowing the situation, but having heard that already, I, I would say that you can't beat the more rural cities at their own game. So cities compete by being a differentiated product. So you're never going to out Frankfurt you're never going to out cute Frankfurt or out Horace Lexington or any of those things. Um, dare I say you're the most urban city in the state and uh, certain people want that. So while certain outsiders might hate it, I bet there's a whole lot of locals who love it and you should play to your strengths. So don't worry about those people. <laughs> Thank you. Don't mind the haters. I have a pretty specific question but it's because um, on a narrow uh, street that parallels Frankfurt Avenue and Brownsboro Road, it's um, Sycamore Avenue, 
uh, a sidewalk in relation to a MSD project many years ago, a sidewalk was put on one block of this that was particularly narrow, so they made it one way for traffic. Um, our neighborhood has asked to have a contra bike lane, but they went down and measured it and said there's not room. Um, so what I'd like to know, you said 10 feet of, of downtown, but it could be narrower. How, what, how wide, what would be the narrowest that a street could be to have one-way traffic with a contra bike lane? I really, I, I really hesitate to say not knowing the specific street, but there are, there's something we're doing now in Maine that's called advisory lanes, where you have a street that's too narrow to have both bike lanes and, in this case, two driving lanes, and they make it narrower anyway with the bike lanes unprotected, but the bike lanes on either side of the street, understanding that when cars have to pass, they actually go into the bike lane temporarily, right? So I would say, you know, the cars are six, six and a half feet wide. Trucks are eight and a half, and buses are eight and a half feet wide, 10 feet with mirrors. But the, the, the I'm often having to, to argue with folks that bike lanes are paint, they're not walls, at least the ones we're talking about. I would feel comfortable striping eight feet for the car mm -hmm. and then five feet for the bike, understanding that there's no barrier and the car can sidle into the bike lane when it needs to. But I need to see it to be more precise. But the, uh, the, the important point I think you're raising is that a bike lane edge, if it's not physically constructed in any way, should be able to constrain a lane, a lane below 10 feet as long as the vehicles can get. And for a one lane slow street, you can have a you, that's the case where you could put a Sharrow in the other direction just as a partner to the mm -hmm. counterflow lane, even though sharrows aren't safe. Hi. In uh, talking about converting some of the streets downtown to two-way or fewer lanes, you were looking at traffic totals on a lot of those roads, like 5,000, 8,000 cars per day. We do have a lot of events downtown. Yes. And some of the feedback I would anticipate from our leadership would be, but we need those one-way streets because when we have UFL basketball games, when we have Thunder River Louisville, we've got to get people out of here fast. Can you talk about kind of how the streets function during like spike traffic periods or, or how we would have to address that? Yeah, so I mean that was, that's what happened in Oklahoma City where the city manager took me aside and put two fingers in my face and said, I'm not going to get stuck in traffic after a Thunder game downtown. And um, it's worked out. But I think, I, I, I think it would be dishonest to say that it won't, that for the major events, because someone raised this earlier today, for the major events, yes, it will be slower to get in and out. And I think you have to describe that as one of the trade-offs that, that people are, are dealing with. It's the emergency event versus the day-to-day -day quality of life. People make decisions to attenuate their trips, have them happen a little earlier, a little bit later. Um, but I, I'm not going to pretend that there, won't be, that there wouldn't be some impacts. But again, I think that you know, when you plan a city for the emergency condition and it doesn't function so well in the standard condition, that's not the best outcome. So for the multi-lane, like the four-lane one-way streets where we have some 3-1 reversions, did those in fact make it safer for pedestrians, cyclists, and or cars? Does it, does that probably does that impact? Probably, but not, not as much as making it a 1-1 a one, one plus turn lane, for example. How, how do you balance those individual needs that everyone wants versus the confined system, which is better for everyone. So I still stand by that statement. However, I pretty much apologized for it in the new edition, where I basically, I, I identified the, the bike uh, advocates as, as one more lobby that absolutely demanded to be satisfied along with all the other folks who, you know, want a piece of the street. Uh, and I kind of take it back in the new edition by saying, that I have yet to see a street where adding bike facilities has not made it better.